Hello fun people, today we're discussing the tragic backstory of the despicable Balonius Gru. I want to be a super villain. Now Gru descended from a long line of villains dating back five generations to Charlotte and Leopold Gru. There were witches, gunslingers, and thieves across that family who broke laws, laundered cash, and were all around pretty mischievous and morally bankrupt. <laughs> and that family legacy was continued by Gru's father, Robert. He became one of the greatest villains of his era, but unfortunately Gru wouldn't get to grow up under his guidance. You see, after Gru's parents were married, they soon had twin boys in the early 1960s. There was Gru and his twin brother Drew. But once they were born, Gru's parents divorced and they each took one son to raise on their own. Robert chose Drew, so their mother Marlena begrudgingly took Gru. Obviously. <laughs> I got second pick. The two parents swore to never see each other again, which meant Gru was forced to spend his entire childhood without his father and brother. While Gru and his mother lived in the United States, Robert moved himself and Drew to the country of Fredonia. There, he established a pig empire as a cover for his work as the supervillain, the Bold Terror. But that's not what Gru's mother told him. She raised her son to believe Robert passed away when he was just a baby. You told me that dad died of disappointment when I was born. Now, while Gru was a sensitive little boy, his mother was just emotionally withdrawn and pretty hostile towards him. But why was she like that? Why did Gru's mother hate him? Well, I think it's because Gru reminded her of Gru's father, who she hated even more. Gru looked like his dad down to his long nose, and early on, Gru found an interest in villainy, exactly like Gru's father. To make matters worse, she also had a preference for Gru's brother, Drew, so she was raising her second choice, and I think she just kind of loathed being a mother in general. Gru's mother's approach to parenting was pretty much to neglect and ridicule her son, even though she clearly cared for Gru to some extent since she documented his early life. He looks like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. Marlena had the ability to be proud of Gru, but she never really showed that when he was growing up. Gru's mother preferred to occupy herself with new men in her life, like gurus, masters, and trainers, or starting new ventures like selling Tupperware. So as long as Gru stayed away from his mother, he was mostly left on his own. Now, growing up, Gru's natural interest in villainy eventually led him to become a big fan of supervillains. His favorite was Wild Knuckles, along with the team Wild Knuckles founded the Vicious Six. Gru had their posters in his room, he had their action figures, and he kept up to date with all of their activities by watching the Villain Network channel. But Gru didn't just want to admire villains from the sidelines, he wanted to be one. And in 1968, Gru's mother actually helped him make that happen. That year, Year, Gru and his mother attended the International Villain Con that was being held in Orlando, Florida. Now, from what I've heard, that city could be a pretty fun place to call home, although back then it was a lot less magical than it is now. At Villain Con, Gru got to encounter one Dr. Joseph Albert Nefario, who was introducing his freeze ray for the first time, and Gru bought one. You see, that year, even though Gru was just a child, he decided it was time to start making a name for himself. He probably was already a petty thief and potentially ruffled some feathers with the local authorities, but he wanted to use his extremely capable mind for criminality. Gru was already plotting to build experimental rockets during the space race, and he either created or found a semi-immortal dog-like creature named Kyle, so he felt prepared to set his sights on pulling off a heist against one of the most notable villains in the world, Scarlet Overkill. She'd been dubbed a criminal genius, broke barriers by becoming the first female supervillain, and had been a keynote speaker at VillainCon, and Gru planned to steal the Queen of England's crown from her. After either assembling or purchasing a motorcycle that could transform into a jet, Gru implemented his plot. He flew to London, used his freeze ray on Scarlet, and made his getaway with the crown. He was able to steal a modern treasure while also humiliating a beloved and feared supervillain. And boy, did that impress the minions Kevin, Stewart, and Bob. But Gru wouldn't hire them just yet. By the way, if you enjoy the videos I create, please consider supporting the channel and going deeper with the community over on Patreon which is linked down below. Over there you can get exclusive live streams with me, early access to new videos, and the ability to chat in our community's private Discord server. You see, after the moon landing in 1969, Gru began to form another dream outside of his evil life. Mom, 
Someday I'm going to go to the moon. Drew was inspired by the astronauts, so he began to iterate on a prototype rocket. What began as a drawing and macaroni art eventually transformed into an actual working rocket ship. And while he'd eventually shelved the concept of going into space in his youth, he'd never forget about the dream of visiting the moon. Now, even though Gru was an actual evil genius, he was mostly bullied and mocked by the other kids at his school. But that didn't discourage him from attempting to show interest in a girl named Lisa soon after the moon landing. But unfortunately, that was a disaster. When he touched her, the entire school ran away from him and said that Lisa had Grudies. And unfortunately, that moment specifically stuck with him for a long, long, long time. The truth was that Gru was kind of just on his own until he decided to expand his evil operations. When he put out a Help Wanted ad, the minions that he had met in London were ready to work for him. While Gru was uncertain of them at first, he eventually broke down and allowed himself to become their mini boss. Sure, Gru's mother thought the little guys were killing her mellow vibes, but they were extremely helpful little creatures for Gru. Like, they were the workforce that constructed Gru's first lair beneath his childhood home. With the minions building out his base, Gru seemed to have been able to focus on miniaturizing his flying motorcycle design, which resulted in him adding rockets to his bicycle. Early on, he also developed new gadgets like a prototype stink bomb and a very effective cheese ray, and he had time to submit an application to be a part of the Vicious Six. And much to Gru's delight, in 1976, he got an interview to join the team at the young age of 11 and 3 quarters. What the world? Here comes Gru! Now, on Gru's way into the Vicious Six's headquarters, he was able to reunite and be formally introduced to Dr. Nefario after their original encounter at VillainCon. At the time, Nefario was developing weaponry for the Vicious Six, while also managing the cover for their subterranean hideout, a record store called Criminal Records. Instantly, Nefario saw something within the little villain, so he gave Gru an invention he was developing called Sticky Fingers in the hopes that he could make a positive contribution to Gru's bright career. If you ever get famous, remember who gave you your first gadget. <laughs> okay. Now, unfortunately, the interview process itself went terribly. The Vicious Six disregarded Gru once they realized he was just a small child, and his heroes humiliated him. So Gru decided he'd prove his worth by stealing the most prized possession, the Zodiac Stone. Gru was able to get away unscathed after the Vicious Six hunted him down, but he wasn't able to hold on to the stone. You see, Gru's minion Otto traded the mystical relic for a pet rock, which absolutely devastated Gru. He had hoped that he would be able to trade the stone for membership into the Vicious Six, but his own minions messed up his plans. That was especially painful since he already had concerns about the minions being ready for the big leagues. In a moment of rage, Gru even fired all of the minions, thinking he'd be better on his own. But that was a mistake that he immediately had to face when he was abducted by Wild Knuckles. You see, the Vicious Six had come to believe that they had succeeded successfully murdered their founder, but that was not the case. Wild Knuckles survived and now hoped that by holding Gru for ransom, he'd force the boy's minions to bring him the Zodiac Stone so that he could take his revenge against his old team. Now, while it may have seemed like Gru was in a hopeless situation, it turned out that getting imprisoned by Wild Knuckles turned out to be a big opportunity. Wild Knuckles was very impressed by Gru. You got real moxie, kid. Stealing from the Vicious Six? <gasps> Did I just receive a compliment from Wild Knuckles? So when Wild Knuckles' crew quit on him, Gru got to help out and be mentored by his biggest hero. Turns out saving someone from their own crocodiles goes a long way to establish some goodwill. You want me to teach you a thing or two? Wild Knuckles then decided to bring Gru along on a heist to steal from the Bank of Evil. There, Gru would encounter Mr. Perkins, who would eventually become Gru's loan officer at the bank. But on that day, Gru was only there to help steal the Mona Lisa. Unfortunately though, during that robbery, Wild Knuckles had his home destroyed by the Vicious Six. That broke him apart and led to him pushing little Gru away. But luckily, that led the little villain to locate his minions. Much to Gru's delight, they had found the Zodiac Stone and had tracked him all the way to San Francisco, but the Vicious Six had finally located him too. While Gru was taken captive by the Vicious Six, Wild Knuckles and the minions came to his rescue and teamed up to save their friend. And once Gru was freed and he gained possession of the Zodiac Stone, he transformed the Vicious Six into a group of rats, making it easy for the Anti-Villain League to arrest them. Wild Knuckles was also brought into custody by Agent Cy Silas Ramsbottom, and soon after the battle, he was pronounced dead in prison. But 
that was all a sham. While Knuckles didn't die, he figured out a way to escape prison without the anti-villain league coming after him. I cannot wait to fake my own death to avoid the authorities. Shoot for the moon, kid. Shoot for the moon. And shoot for the moon, Gru did. With Wild Knuckles free, he was able to continue to mentor Gru throughout the rest of his life. Gru convinced Dr. Nefario to work for him, and Gru truly began to believe in and love all of his little minions. Gru and the minions would go trick-or-treating as a group, they'd go camping, and even competed in a school talent show as a Kiss tribute band. They all became extremely close friends, and Gru took care of them. He paid them all a salary, he let them sleep in his bed when they had nightmares, and he'd wrap up their wounds. Gru and the minions were there for each other through all of the good and evil times. Now, as a teenager, Gru was able to start standing out in the villain world. Criminal publications at one point declared him the villain of the year, and they began to cover and report on his crimes, which must have been very encouraging, especially while he lost his hair. Over the years, Gru continued to develop new schemes, plans, and heists throughout every era and every decade. He kept up with technology more than he kept up with culture and fashion, but he was most aware of what was happening in the villain community. In the 1980s, Gru watched the demise of the child star Balthazar Brad. And in the 90s, he followed the supposed death of El Macho. While villains came and went, Gru was continuously inspired to take on bigger projects, which inevitably brought him back to the Bank of Evil. To attempt to pull off his larger schemes and to continue to fund Nefario and the Minions, he took out loans, which allowed him to accomplish some feats. He stole the Times Square Jumbotron, as well as the Statue of Liberty and the Eiffel Tower from Las Vegas, but unfortunately, most of his plots were not profitable. The business was not looking too hot and the bank was losing their faith in Gru. But Gru was unwilling to stop being a villain because he had something to prove. He longed to show the vicious six and everyone who underestimated him that they were wrong. He hoped to show all of his bullies from school that he was capable of greatness. And most importantly, he wanted to force his mother to be proud of him. But if all that was going to happen, if Gru ever hoped to be known as the greatest villain of all time, he would need to execute the most awe-inspiring feat of villainy the world had ever seen. And to do that, it was time for Gru to accomplish his childhood dream. You and I have been working on this for years. It's everything we've dreamed of. Your chance to make history become the man who stole the moon. Fun people, this is my first Illumination video and I felt like there was no better person to cover than the original all-star, the original superstar that came out of Illumination that was the main character of Despicable Me, it was Gru. It had to be Gru. There's so many things to talk about in the world of Illumination, and I've really been enjoying seeing how all the movies connect. Like, recently I just watched Secret Life of Pets and Sing for the first time. And to prepare for this video, I decided I needed to get something from Illumination in the background, and, and really, it didn't feel like anything could beat a minion. I, I feel like Bob is, is so cute, so I, I really wanted to get him him. He's a little popcorn bucket from Universal Studios, Florida, and I think he's so fun. He's got the little selfie stick and the teddy bear and his eyes move. I think it's just so fun. And so now, now I've got a little bit of another animation studio in, in my space and another new studio to be able to discuss on the channel. And I, I just think it's so fun because each studio has a different feel to them. Each studio has their own kind of unique way of storytelling, their own identity and feeling. I feel like when you go through different moods, each of the studios can bring out different emotions and feelings. I think for me, Illumination is just pure fun. You know, I love talking about different animated characters and movies and worlds and Illumination just opens up a whole new world of possibilities. And I appreciated you coming along and watching this video that was the first of its kind on this channel. Thank you so much. I'm Isaac Carlson, and I hope you have a very magical rest of your day.